My name is Sheila Coronel. I'm a professor of journalism at the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism, and I'm the moderator of this session. And I'm really, really privileged to have three trailblazing journalists who will speak to us today about their work um, to save democracy. Um, so let me, let me begin with just short introductions. To my right here is Lina Atala. Lina is from Egypt. She's a co-founder and chief editor of Mada Masser. If you haven't looked at it, you should, you should check it out online. It's an independent online newspaper. She was previously managing editor of the Egyptian Independent until its print edition was closed down in 2013. As you can imagine, working in Egypt um, is a very challenging um, endeavor, but here she is, and she's thriving and managing to do good work. Next to her is David K. Johnston. Johnston is an American investigative journalist specializing in tax and economic issues. He's written books on tax and economic policy. He's won the Pulitzer for Beat Reporting in 2001. And he's, he told me he's written three and a half books, I don't know what the other half is, on Donald Trump. So um, he's an expert not on democracy but on the erosion of democracy, I guess, and the use of, you know, we, we seldom look at the economic and financial aspects of democratic decline, and I'd like David to talk about that later today. Um, then, Vinod Jose, Vinod Jose, I still can't pronounce your name right, Vinod. Okay, Vinod is the former executive editor of The Caravan. It's, it, it's like the New Yorker of India, it was the first um, long-form narrative journalism um, magazine um, started in two he was editor in 2009 until this year. Caravan has been at the forefront on the critical reporting on Narendra Modi and the rise of Hindu nationalism in India. So very interesting places, including the United States, if I may say so, in places where democracy is being challenged. So we're going to talk today about whether investigations can save democracy. It's a tall order. So my first question to all of you is, question about the premise of this panel. Can investigations actually save democracy? And how? And under what circumstances? And what kinds of investigations? Lena? OK, so um, it all depends on, uh, on how uh, we define democracy. And so if we all agree that uh, it should really uh, transcend uh, you know, um, the ballot box, uh, especially when the ballot box in a lot of the times uh, is, is, is reduced to a gesture, um, which is the case in our country, um, then I would say that investigations are rather important to unsettle the seeming um, comfortable rule of authoritarian regimes basically um, so uh, it's it's uh, it, you know it's it's a bit different in our context and I think that every time um, we try to do something uh, that's a bit revealing about um, how those uh, in power are uh, uh, ruling us um, we earn a bit more ground in uh, trying to unsettle what seems to be uh, settled, which is they are here to rule forever without accountability, with, uh, with, uh, with impunity, and, uh, and so on. Um, and here I'm talking about the kinds of investigations that you know, um, focus on uh, the way uh, in which uh, political rule um, uh, takes place and spreads, uh, the way in which political power is earned, um, again, especially outside the ballot box, uh, especially outside the representative body of parliaments and so on, but as well, um, you know, investigations that look into, um, um, you know, economic power um, and who has the power of uh, wealth. So it's like you, you see investigative journalists as like you know the pebble in the shoe of power. You you unsettle them even if they stay in power. <laughs> yes, it's a very good point. What a, what about you, David? You come from an ostensibly democratic country. Ostensibly. <laughs> and uh, a country where democracy is fast eroding. Does what role does investigative journalism play? I would encourage all of you to pay attention to things we often don't pay attention to. Uh, in America, we've discovered that uh, the cult of Trump 
is part of a large movement to ensure minority, not majority, rule. How do you do that? Well, you do that through laws you pass that make it hard to register to vote or make it easy to disregard your ballot without you knowing about it. By appointing people to positions or getting them elected to positions that get very little attention. For the last 40 years, the Republicans in America, for example, have done a very, very good job of paying attention to what I would call their knitting, their political knitting. They have stationed people in offices that allow them to control things like the way votes are counted, the way districts are designed. These are not the things we normally focus on. They're not considered to be sexy. But it is the details of how government work that we can pay a great deal of attention to. Secondly, I'm a very big advocate of something that I was never allowed to do with the New York Times or the LA Times, uh, uh, anywhere in my career back to the 1960s until I had my own uh, publication. Uh, instead of describing someone as a representative of this party from that district, we would also say, you know, who received 83% of his money from fossil fuel companies or 61% of his money from pharma companies. And I believe in that because I've had numerous members of Congress and the state legislatures that I've covered over the decades tell me quite candidly in many cases that their constituents are not the voters. Their constituents are the people who finance them. Or as a New York State Senator said to me one day when we shared a cab from LaGuardia Airport into Manhattan, since I live in another place and flew to work every week. He said, you know, I've been in the Senate for 10 years, and every morning when I shave, I look in the mirror and I think about what do I need to do today for my 10 biggest donors? Now, what they want isn't good for them, but I have to persuade them I'm trying to get it for them, or they will fund somebody else. And I thought, okay. And then he said, and you know, I don't recall once ever looking in my mirror while shaving and saying, what am I going to do today for ordinary constituents? Campaign finance systems and laws matter a lot. And I was very involved in covering American campaign finance reform after Watergate. We're going back now 50 years. And America passed some tough campaign finance laws that turned out to be utter disasters. They blew up. And all around the world, you want to look at who's financing politicians, who's running the voting and voting registration systems, and know who these people are. And in many cases, I think you'll find they'll be quite candid in talking about what they do if you put them at ease. So. Thank you. So again, it's exposing them so that even if things don't change, they are... They are it, it, at ease. All we can do is tell people things. Uh, when great social movements arise, they're like tsunamis. You can put your hand up, but it's not going to stop the water from running over you. And all around the world, we are seeing the rise of fundamentalist religions in different countries and different faiths, of authoritarianism. And there's a large economic trend behind that because of all the upward redistribution of money. That's what my best-selling series on how the American economy really works revealed and showed how it's right in the public record, but nobody was writing about this stuff, mostly because they don't understand how it works. But there is a great fundamental social change taking part right now, just like after uh, the Black Death in Europe, the church lost its grip on people. Because if one out of three of people around you died, you had to begin to question what you were being told about God. And so we may not be successful, but all we can do is tell people as best we can about the evils that are being done and the efforts to usurp a word you should uh, try to get to readers often. Okay, thank you. Vinod, democracy under siege in India. Can investigations help save that democracy? <sighs> That's really one of the sort of existential questions for sure. And I think there is certainly a big role that as investigative journalists, uh, as a community, we have to pay. And, and, and the country that I come from, it's, uh, the, the whole idea was to build a brown men's enlightened world, so to speak. I mean, that was the whole idea. Um, new from the colonial rule, 
there was a very romantic dream. I remember, you know, growing up, uh, you know, in a school, going to a public school, 3,000 miles away from Delhi, uh, a freedom fighter came to our class and said, look, you know, we have to show to the world that we can excel. There have been 300 years of colonial rule, and you have to respect diversity. You have to, this is, this is a country where thousands of languages are spoken, um, all kinds of promises of what a textbook idea of democracy is. But then gradually in, in, in my own lifetime, what we have seen is that is being captured, this whole idea has been hijacked and taken for um, the making of a majoritarian idea of what India is. Um, and as we know, when the subcontinent got divided, there was a, a, a Muslim Pakistan, of so to speak, and the Hindu nationalists lost out in that game within the ideological debate in India, they wanted to make a Hindu Pakistan, and that did not happen. But now over the years, we see a gradual uh, capture of the system uh, through public intelligentsia, through media, uh, institutions of democracy like judiciary, which are supposed to play certain rule, uh, certain independent role, we see systematically systems getting shut down, like a patient in coma. Uh, so investigative journalism uh, has a major role to play and, and the organization that I've been heading for 15 years, uh, we have been systematically trying to push that horizon, uh, be a watchdog, uh, and there were strict rules even then, even before Modi came to power, that you can't cover judiciary critically, you would be a, you'll have a contempt of court and things like that, but it was very certain for people like me that without casting uh, that level of scrutiny on all aspects of democracy, institutions, whether it's corporate money, judiciary, uh, climate change, uh, defense budget, defense spending, you know, you can't have a comprehensive uh, coverage uh, that the journalism is, journalism as an institution is supposed to deliver. So certainly, even, even when under set, you know, a lot of duress, and, and personally also we pay some prices for this, I face 10 sedition cases in India. Uh, and that, that puts me probably in the League of Gandhis and Nehru's for no reason for fighting for democracy in that sense, but just going to a newsroom every day and then doing my job. I mean, I'm not uh, out on the street, uh, you know, gathering people together uh, for a revolt against the state. No, I'm just going uh, to my office and, and uh, discussing ideas with reporters and supervising reporting and getting stories done. And so this is where the country has come to, where on paper, uh, on, in diplomatic terms, you might still try to capture whatever is left still to call yourself and present yourself as world's uh, biggest democracy, but in practice, in essence, uh, it is just a claim and it doesn't get delivered to the ordinary citizens. So this is a question I'd like to ask all of you. In, in many of our countries, the idea of democracy has been undermined very much by ruling elites and by existing socioeconomic forces. Journalists, by defending democracy or the democratic process, in some ways are going against the grain of what people emotionally believe, right? They no longer have that faith in democracy. And here you are saying democracy is what we need. How do you operate in a situation where there is popular support for strongman rule, for autocracy, for populism? I guess we don't wake up in the morning and, um, and tell people uh, democracy important. Uh, instead, what we wake up in the morning is, um, and do is write a story and reveal something. And, um, and, and I think the, the counter-emotional power of revelation um, um, operates in a way uh, that, you know, put at discomfort this idea that, uh, oh, maybe authoritarianism um, is, is, is better, and, and, or maybe, you know, democracy is, is, is dysfunctional or useless or whatever. Um, and this has been our experience, basically, that um, first, we are not operating in a democratic context anyways for it to be weakened. So we have to remember that we are talking about a completely different context. Uh, we are operating in a context that is, um, you know, deeply authoritarian, um, and that is, and it is authoritarianism that came after an uprising, so people have experienced what it means to have this brief opening, 
uh, they have experienced what it means to have a relative uh, free flow of information for a moment, and then everything was shut down, like the lights were off in no time. Um, so there is a, a state of discontent with that. There isn't a comfort with that. There is a feeling that um, there is something going on there that is wrong uh, with those who are, who are ruling us. And the proof is that you know our livelihoods are affected. Our you know the economy is in crisis. The you know we ha we don't have rights. Nobody's happy. Um, and and this is the sentiment that is there. So. We don't necessarily work on fueling it because th that's not our job. Uh, we're not uh, an oppositional force in that sense, but we give it some grounding. Uh, we give it, uh, we create the shape for people to understand what this discontent is about. So basically when uh, we write a story uh, that reveals how um, the president has um, influence the formation of parliament in the most intricate of ways so that the parliament that we have is uh, fully designed to serve his interests uh, and we have the material evidence to show how this parliament was formed, people start understanding, people start giving shape to their discontent and I feel like this is an important um, emotional value, this, this value of revelation, of feeling betrayed, and you know exactly why. It's no longer in the abstract. It's no longer that the rulers are up there, corrupt, doing things. No, we know exactly how they put together this parliament that was supposed to be a, represent, a representative body, basically. So, yeah, creating this power of revelation, of knowing. David, this power of revelation doesn't seem to work among, especially among Trump supporters. The more they know about Trump, the more they still like him, right? Well, a shrinking number of people, Sheila, fall into that category. Um, look, uh, there are 8 billion people on this planet. There's an incredibly vast variety of views about the world. Uh, there are people in America I have interviewed who absolutely firmly want to restore slavery. They think it's the worst thing that happened was the Civil War, and we need to bring slavery back. And I don't mean old world slavery, which was not at all like new world slavery. Totally different. People volunteered in the old world to be slaves in many occasions. Uh, what we need to do is ask questions of people about how they came to their beliefs and the reasons they have these beliefs. Why do we see under the Modi government this effort to take away citizenship from Muslims and I presume therefore other religious minorities? Um, we need to listen to people. And if you can listen to people, that's not just hearing their words, but listening to what they say. You can find out the things that are driving their views. So Donald Trump's support to me is no surprise. Um, one of the things I've pointed out in my reporting is that 90% of Americans in the year Trump uh, won the Electoral College, 2016, had less income than they did in 1973, almost a half century earlier. 4% less, nobody knew that till I wrote about it and showed it from the official data. And then on top of that, people used to get health care on top of their salaries, now it comes out of their salaries. They used to get a pension on top of their salaries, now it comes out of their salaries. And for every dollar they developed an equity in their homes, they took on $2 of debt. So the bottom 90% of Americans were much worse off Guess what? If people lose control of their economics, as Karl Polnia taught from the 1930s, they will listen to anyone who promises them the future won't be more terrifying than today. And that's what a lot of people see because of these uh, mega changes, meta changes taking place around the world. But it's important to listen to people and I would fault heavily all American major news organizations and I work for or five of the biggest ones, for not listening to people and listening too much to people who are already in power and who have a vested interest in things. Um, people will, it's very difficult to get people who have been conned to acknowledge that they have been. If you've been taken by somebody, whether it's a little deal on a car or you got wiped out of all your finances because you believed a Nigerian prince email, people will hide that from their spouse if they can. Sometimes people will commit suicide to avoid having to deal with that. But 
if you can begin to find the cracks in these relationships. Uh, George Lakoff, a cognitive science at UC Berkeley who has written brilliantly about this and very kindly tutored me, uh, points out that uh, political leaders have come in two flavors, mother figures and father figures. Mother figures are nurturing and supportive. Father figures are, you know, you'll do what I say. If you can break the bond with the father figure, which it's much harder to do, they become rabidly anti that kind of position. But to know how that breaks, you have to listen to people. You have to let them talk and not challenge the stupid things they may say to you or the inchoate things they say, but find out where is this coming from? How did you, is this how you grew up? Well, if it's how your parents raised you and you haven't changed, that's one thing. But if you were raised in a different kind of household, then you now run yourself. How did you get there? How did that journey happen? It requires a lot of listening. And let me just give you my favorite little story about that. After the Exxon Valdez oil tanker crash in Alaska, which was now, what, 30 years ago, roughly? One of the best reporters who's ever lived, Eric Nalder, arranged with ExxonMobil to be on one of its ships coming into Anchorage to write about the new rules of ocean safety, which included requiring that in the prow of the oil tankers as they entered and left the harbor at Anchorage, someone be out in the prow so that if something was in the water they might hit, as the Exxon Valdez did, they could warn them. And it's, this is Alaska, it's January. Can you imagine how bitter cold it was to be out there? And for 45 minutes, Eric Nalder listens to this guy, and then Nalder asks him, well, how did you get this job? And he said, oh, well, you have to be an able-bodied seaman. And Eric goes, oh, okay. And he says, but I couldn't qualify for the other jobs as an able-bodied seaman. And Eric says, well, why not? And he says, oh, I'm blind. <laughs> Literally, the rules allowed a blind person to be the one in the front of the ship looking out for things they might strike. 45 minutes in the bitter cold to get that fact. Uh, when I wrote about a man who was framed for a murder by a cop and found the real killer, when I first met the wrongfully convicted kid who I was certain was guilty as could be, and he started crying, it took me 45 minutes just to get one fact I, out of him that could be verified. And eventually a whole lot of facts that led to the real killer. But you have to listen to people. You have to let them talk. You have to make, pay close attention to what they say. And that's one of the ways we can show how these things happen. Right. Yes, we know it. It's hard to be listening to this really, you know, Hindu nationalist who seem you can't change their minds. Is there, is there a listening to be done there? And has, has, have Indian journalists done enough of that listening? <clears throat> I think it, I don't know, I, I, I don't think I approached it as whether we can change their minds, but I approached it as in terms of a catchment area for stories and the sources and, and material, because at that moment when you are either as a reporter or, uh, or trying to work on a lead, often, your most immediate concern is to get the story right and also the protection of the journalists and the reporters and the editors, everyone involved. Um, whether it's to do with, I think there is a series of um, terrorist attacks that the Hindu rights organizations have been doing since 2004 or five, very systematic attacks. And it was all blamed on um, foreign terrorist organizations initially and, and, and stories of that kind where we put reporters to go into uh, the, the, the darker world of uh, uh, religious communities and, and then find people who were um, getting help from certain uh, sections in the Indian defense and then getting material out from the organized uh, public sy systems. Uh, and then from there, making bombs and um, you know, blasting trains and religious organizations and sites. So uh, we noticed there again, um, you know, far deeper international cloud. It's not just to do with the Hindu nationalists in India. Um, something that, uh, of course, um, you know, he, he's sort of very famous now as uh, Putin's Rasputin, Alexander Dugin. And and when when you uh, you know stumble upon information like 
he was in India in the 1990s trying to recruit and make alliances with the far right. Uh, or for that matter, again, following Hindu right, uh, you know, I think we, as a newsroom, got a wind of what is going to happen uh, from, let's say, 2010, 2011. We saw a character like Trump going to come in, in, in the United States while just following the reporting in India. Um, uh, and that's because the far right coordination between uh, some of the European countries, India, and some sections within the US. And this is all, evident, there were evidences um, that we could see in 2012, 13, 14. Now, which leader, which organization, who, probably the details weren't clear. I remember doing, um, uh, you know, Caravan published a big cover story on the far right and the far right, global far right coalitions. Uh, now, looking forward, I think what is sort of also quite worrying is uh, this phase of anti-democracy and autocratic leaders, uh, they're far more well entrenched and deeply connected than they have ever been in history. Uh, and it's, it could be just one Modi in India, but there are several Modis all over the world for many. And uh, the other thing in India, it's not just one leader Modi, there is a, f uh, a fascist far right organization which has been nearly a century old. And they have been systematically changing the society and, and it's far difficult, far more difficult to change politics when the society itself uh, has changed and its views have changed in a way that uh, for journalists to keep worrying about uh, what more to do outside of the story, probably it's, it's, it's too much to handle. So I think any given point often, when you're in a newsroom and investigating stories, uh, it didn't strike uh, somebody like me to, at that point, to think beyond what the stories that you're doing, but you knew that maybe the civil society, the academia, the position, the political space, the judiciary, it's everybody else's job. and as, as most models in, in journalism, social, social democratic model, for example, expects other sections in society to play its role. And uh, often it's not, it, 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 it has to be outside the brief of investigators because we can't be activists and academics and intellectuals all at the same time while making sure that we get our stories right. And it is, it is very difficult to get these investigations right. Often there can be plans, there can be misinformation, there can be things which will uh, get us in trouble. So uh, I don't think I have had enough time to labor over whether that investigation or journalism will go to change a Modi supporter. Maybe it would eventually, maybe it's uh, everybody's job, maybe it's not the job of journalists, I don't know those uh, answers, answers to those questions, but I think when we do our job as journalists and investigative journalists, and we can't be investigative journalists in a country like in India without paying attention to the biggest political force, which is the far right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we, we have been getting that right, uh, that space for, for 15, 20 years now, that any, they, they take the calls on who the judges are, who the, who the editors and the publishers and who the uh, influential people in society are. And that is a worrying fact, because in, in, in 100 years ago in Europe, uh, or 90 years ago, uh, whether it's Mussolini or Hitler, they were individuals who carried a fascist idea with them. But long before Modi came to power, the Indian far right were in touch with Mussolini and they were getting lectures on how to set up the fascist organization in India. And in the first Indian general election in 1952, they were a tiny minority, 2%, 3% votes. But now they're close to 40%, they're in power in an electoral, through using the electoral mechanics. So I think if we look individually as a leader or on any of these people, the far right might be here for long because that ideology has gained ground more than ever in history. You made a very good point about the international connections of this white supremacist or Hindu supremacist or far right movements. Um, <clears throat> and you've done some investigations in that, obviously causing great danger. But let's, let's talk about Egypt, for example, where there really is no far-right movement, but there, Egypt is supported by the United States. You know, there's US military assistance. What, is, what are, you know, looking at the support networks for right-wing extremism, how do we investigate that and who do we investigate? Yeah. I think um, one of, um, 
one of the stories that uh, that has gained a lot of traction um, um, in the work we do in Egypt is a story that tries to understand um, how Egypt's geopolitical position is has evolved uh, in the last years, um, and you know what what is the cartography of uh, a power that is influencing influencing decision making uh, at home, and again in a context where. You don't really have a democracy uh, where you don't really have this popular constituency that, whether we like it or not, still continues to play a role as a source of power. Um, there are these alternative sources of power, which is the, you know, the superpowers, the, the, the evolving powers in the region. So in our case, we're not just talking about, uh, about the, the traditional superpowers. We're also talking about evolving uh, Gulf power that is uh, uh, particularly manifested in financial power, in the power investments, in the power of... Um, of, of uh, coming to the rescue when we are going through uh, a major economic crisis, debt repayment um, um, challenges, and, and, and so on. So one of the stories that, um, that resonates with people is to try to understand um, this cartography and how it's evolving. And, you know, unfortunately, um, uh, the, the, because um, we have been going through this major economic crisis and that goes back historically to, you know, the mismanagement of uh, the assets, the economy, um, and, you know, we cannot also ignore global market integration and how it was done uh, in many ways that, you know, has been extractivist in our case. Um, there has been a major political uh, economic first, but with it came the political dependency on regimes uh, that don't like uh, to see freedoms in our country. So we're talking about, you know, certain Gulf players um, that are uh, the primary influencers of, um, of the political situation uh, back at home right now. So if we, if you want to agree that the world is evolving into this multipolar um, um, kind of cartography where we're not just talking about the traditional influencers, but we're also talking about evolving influence um, that is very aggressive in Talking nature. About which governments, for example? Um, Gulf governments. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Small countries that have a lot of power. Yeah. Um, but also big kingdoms. Um, you know, the, again, um, I guess that um, this is the kind of influence um, that is very palpable um, on, on, you know, on right. how how freedoms are, are lived or unlived in our country um, time right. and again. So. so that is what investigative journalists should be looking at, is this, all these powers that support strong men or autocrats and maintain them in power, and it's, and financially they, and politically. Exactly, yeah. and, and they get a lot of traction in the sense that people want uh, to know, you know, people want to know what kind, you know, the region has been marred with all these proxy wars, so you have a war in Syria, you have a war in Sudan, you have a war in Libya, and there is no way you cover these stories. And we cover all these stories because we cover the neighborhood, because they affect us. And there is no way you can cover these stories with an investigative lens without looking at regional dynamics and without looking at who are the bigger powers playing and, and, and fighting these wars on these grounds. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, the U.S. is supposed to be the beacon of democracy in the world. It, is that still real? Is it? Oh, it's a very mixed more? bag. I mean, the yeah. U.S. is an empire, and empires behave in a certain way to maintain their influence and their power. The U.S. has done a lot of good things, and it's done a lot of horrible things, and I think it's a very mixed, uh, mixed bag. But one of the things to go to the heart of your question to think about is, Understanding things at the 30,000 foot level where you can see the mountains and the contours and the ocean line, but then looking for and putting in context the political termites who are eating away at the political system. Who knows about termites in their house, if you live in a country where you have termites, until there's some visible damage, you know, the wall collapses or uh, something goes wrong. And we should be looking for the political termites and putting them in a larger context. And a lot of that involves foreign governments. 
uh, the American news media did a just terrible job of reporting on Russian interference in the 2016 and 2020 American elections. The absolute clear proof that the Russians were deeply involved uh, in emails to Donald Trump's uh, uh, people at Trump Tower. The Kremlin wants to help you win. And the only thing any patriotic American involved in presidential campaign should do if they get an email like that is pick up the phone, call the FBI, and say, hi, I need to speak to someone in counterintelligence. You don't meet with these folks. So foreign influence, wherever you are, Egypt has all sorts of interests working on its society uh, because they have a vested interest in maintaining the current CC government and its policies. And the same is true of the US. A uh, lot of controversy arising now about India and its relationship to the United States and Canada, we've discovered in the last few days. And so it's important to look at these. Uh, you're also going to see laws passed and regulations adopted that affect how other countries uh, one way or another intersect with your company. Don't ever write about a law you haven't read. Do not listen to the people who say, this is what that law does. And when you read law, if you don't understand something, and that's totally to understandable, you go to find law professors and say, what does this language mean? What do these terms mean? What are they doing here? And you'll often find that embedded in laws that are presented as, oh, this is a great thing. It will help benefit democracy. No, it does the exact opposite because you have to know what it says. And as so I'd strongly urge you to you know, read the laws and the regulations that are, you're going to you write about. Don't just take someone's word for what they say and be vigilant about foreign interference by individuals, by governments, and by institutions, mostly corporations and their uh, marketing uh, trade organizations. You know, do you see India exporting this model, the Modi model, elsewhere? Well, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, these are, I mean, post-Cold War, there was that phase of a unipolar world, and then now India, learned quite well that it's a huge market and it can play that with any Western countries who will try to tell them like, look, this is a violation of a certain norm and you as a largest democracy should behave. But then you see, even with Biden's relationship with Modi, it's quite transactional. Um, and they could be the China factor, but there's also the uh, never disappearing factor that this is a huge market, this is the world's biggest market, to, you know, which will help your corporation sell your goods. And whether it's the defense market or whether it's a consumer durable market. So at some point, I think the time that we live in, we are seeing the old soft power of diplomacy sort of disappeared, where each country will have something to use it with the empire or you know anybody for that matter. Look, we need to uh, be pragmatic about our policies, and that's um, and that way I think the termites are going global, and 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 you know that way we find no way to sort of um, as people who believe in democracies and <clears throat> in accountability and transparency and. Uh, justice, um, you know, uh, most of us who are journalists believe in this, and we find very few support from the state missionary, which would have been the case, let's say, 40, 50 years ago. Um, that's one. Second, uh, there is, uh, as you're, if you're following the news between Canada and India in the last few days, uh, we see a huge diplomatic tussle that we have gotten into where um, the Canadian Prime Minister uh, has said in the parliament that Indian intelligence agencies were behind the killing of a Sikh activist in Canada. Um, and of course, clearly India has denied it and they've uh, uh, fired the, uh, the Canadian diplomat and then, you know, th there's all kind of exchanges happening. Now, you know, it is, it is very uh, alarming to watch these things happening between countries which call it's a democracies where one sovereignty has been, uh, uh, you know, you, you send your agents to another country if that is true, if that is the case. Uh, and the audacity, I don't think, would have been there 10, 15 years ago. 
So there's clearly a, a certain kind of confidence that these autocratic leaders are gaining from each other in doing bad things and pushing the horizons of uh, the level of evil things yeah. that each is capable of. And that should worry us. And, and, and I think if the political scientists are right, the time that we live in probably is witnessing the third anti-democracy wave in history. Right. The first pro-democracy wave where some close to 30 countries yeah. declared democracies happened uh, 150 years ago. Then with Mussolini, the number of democracies came down to just 12 or so in 1942. Yeah. Then you see then again a pro-democracy wave. So we have seen this very cyclical mm -hmm. move of how our time has developed. And I think the third anti-democracy wave should be followed by a fourth democracy wave. Yeah. And when will that start happening and how will it start happening? Which part of the world? We don't know. But then it's congregations like this, it's investigative journalists like this who will have a role to play in some sense at that point. And we need to wait out for that moment to happen while doing our job. And it will happen if that's what history will. But how do you, will investigative journalists help make it happen? Can they help make it happen? Or these big historical forces that really we have very little agency? We have a role to play, just being around itself, just being in business itself. Uh, documenting. Documenting it. Yeah. And, and then putting it to the conscience of the people. Yeah. Uh, and that is what has happened if we turn back in history. Maybe it might be a bloody way of uh, reaching a fourth wave. Uh, I hope it is not. Uh, but being around and documenting all this is very important, and that's where the role of investigative journalism comes into picture. What other roles do investigative reporters play at a time of democratic regression? You've talked about um, documenting what's currently happening so that in the future there can be accountability, at least also at least a historical record that is accurate. What, is our, what are other roles do we play? Are we there, for example, to carry the flag and give hope and say, we're still here? And, you know, like Martin Luther King, say, I've seen the promised land. Is that, is that what journalists should be doing? I mean, for me, the, uh, documenting is also never for itself. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's really... Um, it's really what um, what gets produced with the with that power of being in the know of knowing. So you know, gaining uh, a certain um, awareness of again. Uh, uh, for example, one of the things we really like to work on is. We don't like to take authoritarianism for granted. We don't like to stop at the idea that uh, we are being run by an authoritarian regime and that's it. We actually feel that part of our responsibility as journalists and as investigators is to try to understand how this authoritarianism model is evolving every day. What kind of tools um, uh, it's using, what kinds of uh, tools it's letting go of, uh, what is the map of alliances um, at this point that gives it power? Um, and, you know, where is it also uh, being weakened? What are uh, its, its, uh, if its weak spots and so on? Um, and in doing that, I feel that one of the things we do is that, on one hand, for the people, uh, we give this awareness of how things uh, are going. So, again, this grounding of... Um, you know, it's not just authoritarianism in the abstract. This is how it happens. But also, I think it does have a chilling effect on the authorities in the sense that I do think that there is more attention paid to certain practices um, uh, when they get talked about by investigative journalists. So, for example, to give you an example, in Egypt, pretrial detention is um, often used as a punitive measure uh, against, uh, you know, uh, activists, journalists, and so on. So, you know, we don't have to go through the prosecution process and all of that. We just, you know, uh, throw people in jail indefinitely uh, in a, in a pretrial detention. We even break the two years limit. Um, and that's, you know, a punitive measure. Now, there have been so much investigative work done to basically prove this idea that 
um, pretrial detention is actually being used as punishment uh, and outside of its needed context. And you know, the, and and this is also the power of accumulation. This has been said over and again in different forms and shapes, to the extent that you know, even though we are living, you know, in the most uh, intense moment of control, the authorities are not able to just go ahead uh, so easily with pretrial detention anymore. They have to a start defending themselves, b even start making promises of changing the law or stopping the practice. C, let alone starting to release people. Um, so we can't deny that there is um, an effect, even if small, um, when you know you put the information out there and you create awareness around it. And I feel that the democratic wave might not come from this place in particular, but also um, there are these different fragments that create um, the constellation of a change on the longer run. When revolutions happen, what we tend to, to, revolutions are very hegemonic, so we tend to just look at the days of the revolution themselves. But we have to remember that before revolutions, there have been journalists, independent journalists, working tirelessly in order to document violations and human rights violations and so on, that actually helped create this revolutionary moment. And maybe we are in that kitchen right now. Maybe yeah. we have to remember that. David, do you want to say something about the US, which is very polarized? I mean, by doing this, aren't you heightening the polarization in yeah. the country? I, I actually don't think the US is as polarized as the polls indicate. Um, and I could give a whole talk on why we can't trust polls in America right now. But uh, on, on the basis of uh, the basic point of your question, keep in mind that the official version of events is not and cannot be the truth, and yet that's almost all of what we report. It's the unofficial version of events. And also keep in mind that even the most authoritarian government cannot operate without an enormous amount of disclosure of what it's doing. So if you step back from the official version of events and think independently, you will see things. And I'll give you an example of that. My very first or second week as a columnist for Reuters, I went to Singapore, which every year stories appear, lowest tax country in the world. Not possible. It's, you can't look at all the public services in Singapore, it can't be true. And what do I find out after two days there? Well, the government forces workers, domestic workers, not Americans or Brits who are there, to, on top of their taxes, give the government a third of their income to save. And there's a record of this program, and it turns out you get a little over one, inflation plus 1% 1 when you retire for your old age. What happens to the money? Well, there's another document, and it showed that they earn inflation plus 5%. So, well, not technically a tax, it's the equivalent of a tax. It has an 80% tax on people's capital through this mechanism. You pay 1%, but you earn 5 That makes them the highest tax country in the world. There are things like that in the public record all over the place, even in authoritarian societies. And you want to find those, and you want to tell them to people. And the way to do that is to not think in terms of the official version of events. Yes, you need to get the official version of events. You need to say the president, the dictator, the head of the company said or did X. But as soon as that's there, you want to step back and say, now what's going on here? And I, I find the useful way to do that is I imagine that I'm a cosmic journalist who came here from another uh, galaxy, and I arrive, and I'm the head of the economics team, and my job is to examine in rank order of size the economy of this planet. And the, my report back home would begin with, well, there's this thing in the Earth called tax. And it's the biggest economic activity on the planet, by far. It's about 40% of the planet's economic activity. And everybody says they hate it, so why is it the biggest thing if they hate it? And if you start from that premise, you will begin to see things. Uh, and, and that's the most essential skill you can have, is look at the official version of events and then ask yourself, what's really going on here? and where are there documents or uh, information that you can use to inform people about the unofficial version of events.